you know, maybe doing a little bit extra in that particular region, you know. So they are really beneficial, but it's, um, I, I am going to provide everybody with a couple of examples of what those review, those annual review, self reviews look like. How many questions are in these exams? 300. This photo we will send you up. What's up? They, they do, they do. They, they have different charges for both, for each exam. Is that what you're asking? No, is the school. Does the school yeah. have the exam? How do that? We will go by your own or the school will then. Go by yourself. For the, for the, for the, for the exam path or for the test? What it is. The test, there's different testing sites all over the, um, the state. So depending on where you want to go to take it, you can go to Concord. I went to Concord to take mine. I took another one of my exams in Portsmouth. But you can take them, you select where you want to go. They don't, they don't have the test here at the school, and the school doesn't pay for the test. Yeah. Is that what you're asking? No. no I'm not my question is, if, well, well, how do you, uh, you do that? We, we have to go by our by yourself, or if the score will get shot at the end? So it's no, concerned. everybody can schedule their own test. Yeah, you know, yeah. Everybody can schedule, depending on, <clears throat> some, I, I spent probably about three months test, uh, studying before I took the exam. So someone may want to spend six months studying before the exam. Someone may want to only spend a week. So we, we can't really schedule everybody at once to take their test. Everybody can kind of do that on their own. Have you seen people be able to get jobs just with the certification and then without? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Most, most employers are looking for someone that's certified. I've seen people hired without their certification, so don't let that prevent you from applying for a position that may potentially come. Okay, so just after you finish the program here, and then you're going to get a job without having to be officially certified. I've never seen people hired without their certification. I have seen people hired. Yeah. But is it um, low risk? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, does it happen a lot, or are they looking more for you to be certified? It depends on the organization. It does. A lot of, um, I know like the Elliott, they're, what they're doing now is they're calling it homegrown coders. So they're t bringing in coders that are fresh out of school and they're homegrowning them. You know, they're, they're taking and they're grooming them, I should say, to be the type of coders that they want for that type of an organization. You're homegrown. So they are looking for um, coders that are new to the field. You know, coders make really good money. If you can have entry level coders coming in, you know, and starting that at, at $17, $18 an hour instead of paying $35 an hour for a season coder, you can hire two or three coders for the same price you'd be paying one. And ICD 10 is going to bring a, a huge backlog of work to these healthcare organizations. I know um, in some organizations, they have 35, 50 coders, they're talking about increasing their workforce by 50%. You're talking bringing on another 25 coders. Okay, do we do that with all people who are already, you know, at that top level where it's $35 a piece, or do we hire three? You know, it's you got to think of it that way. The um, the education part of certification wasn't required before. I know years ago when I first um, was looking into going back to school and doing the certifications and gaining my credentials. Um, when I was looking into that, the only requirement was a high school diploma. Um, I recall back for you know the RHIT, you didn't have to have an accredited K M accredited school. So everything has changed probably since 2006, where they're changing the requirements and the coding requirement just changed within the past couple of years that you need to have you know at least a year of post-secondary education with anatomy and physiology, the medical terminology. That wasn't a requirement before. Now they require it. So. And when I, I'll go online and look at the different jobs, and it seems to me that most employees are looking for, they want a couple of years of experience because they, they know that a new coder is going to be just bad and the coder is not producing like they want. So a lot of the jobs will say two One thing.
which will help you gain experience. Um, practice, practice, practice. One of the first things that they do when you apply for a coding position is they'll give you a test. You'll have a test, and they'll ask you to complete that test, and you know, then they'll look at how well you did. So the more you practice, the more accurate you are, increases your chances, of course, of getting hired into a position or role as a coder. We had, um, St. Joe's just had three positions filled by, by new coders. One of the people that they actually gave a position to had no, has had no education in coding whatsoever. Um, of course, it was through work experience. She was just familiar because I think a family member was a coder, so they were just familiar with those functions. But of course, they did enough practice to pass that exam. You know, if you can assure that you're, you know, it, it's kind of like when I said that those review questions and those workbooks questions, you know, that is for you. It's beneficial for you to just keep working through them because, of course, speed, accuracy, all of those things are gonna help build that skill as a coder. In advanced coding, there's also a packet that you receive, which is, um, they call it um, Mosaic software, and it's a, it's a simulated coding practicum. So you complete 40 hours of inpatient coding, 40 hours of outpatient coding, electronically, just like you would in the real world, because a lot of code is code remotely. We all know this, right? So if you're doing this, and you're going through the MOSI simulations, you get work cues from physicians, you get, it's, it's like real world. And you complete all of this, and it actually gives you a breakdown of all of the coding assignments that you performed, and that is excellent for your resume. You know, we had attempted to begin having internships for coding students, but there's a matter of liability there, because of course, most code is remote. You know, if you know somebody that is coding that will allow you to job shadow, by all means, please do it. Please do it. If you know someone out there in industry and they're willing, you know, if I hear of any opportunities, of course I'm gonna share with everybody. But, you know, if you have that opportunity, you know, even if it's volunteering an hour or two hours a week, just to see what coders do in the real world, what they do, how they perform, you know, take them up on that opportunity. It's, um, it's good to see, you know, this is something that you, you will potentially be doing. It's good to see how it's done out there. But again, can't really arrange for students to, you know, go to someone else's home to get an internship practice. It's just not, there's too much risk involved there. All right, so musculoskeletal, when we uh, went through that, that's a lot of um, fractures, different types of, and respiratory, of course, there's quite a few endoscopies in that particular this week we're looking at the cardiovascular system and the we got here cardiovascular and digestive system. How many of you are in legal aspects right now? Couple. Well, I'm going to give this to all of you because this is really the we talk about coping as being a uh, it's a it's a HIPAA function because, of course, all the quotes that were applying are confidential and private about the patient information. So this is a really good handbook for, of course, CODIS, VILAs, and HIM staff um, on the new rule that is effective this fall. There's a new, new rule that comes into play. So this is just for your, your personal reading pleasure or bedtime reading <laughs> either way, but uh, it's, it's got some great information. So, this week we're looking at the cardiovascular system. Let me pass out this week's PowerPoint. That might be helpful. And the cardiovascular system is very complex. One of the main 
procedures that you're going to see without getting into all of the um, arterial and the venous uh, portions of it is the application of pacemakers. Can anyone tell me what a pacemaker is? Every mind you have to be, right? <laughs> battery operated. Does everyone know that? It's battery operated. Well, your artificial pacemaker. What's that? Artificial pacemaker is. <laughs> Say that again. Your artificial pacemaker is. Your, your heart has a natural pacemaker. Right. So that fails. So it's they it's kind of. Artificial. We've got a few different different types of. Yeah, there is. They typically they last for about. The battery. Yeah, it lasts for about ten years. And it's actually a lot of it is done now where they actually made. And then we use a lot of the times they use telemedicine mm -hmm. to actually check a pacemaker check. Yeah, and like the nursing homes, they do it all over the phone now. They actually have a special machine. You actually just go into it and you actually put it on that person's chest, and it actually can somehow read it, and it actually it's all of it over the phone. Pretty amazing, line. isn't it? Uh, for the for the one that tell medicine? For the better battery. Is it a bad thing? Yeah, like a mister one that they put it inside. Um so in this particular section you're gonna see uh, in the beginning, anyway, you're going to see a lot about you know changing batteries, cha you know doing doing different um, functions with the pacemakers. There's three main sections to the cardiovascular section, and they're of course the cardiovascular, the heart, um, hemic, lymphatic systems. What are the hemic and lymphatic systems? Immunology. And then we have the uh, mediastinum and diaphragm section. So these are all found in the cardiovascular section, or this, this particular part of the surgery section. So for our pacemakers, we either have the pulse generator, which is the battery, or we have leads. And when we have the leads, they're electrodes. So we may have a single chamber, which means, what do, you, what do you think a single chamber electrode is? One chamber, right? And then if it's a dual chamber, it's two. And then if it's a multiple changer, uh, chamber, then it's more than two, okay? So, of course, when we're, when we're coding these particular types of procedures, there's a couple of questions that we need to ask ourselves. Um, A lot of the times, the, this is where those arterial and the venous uh, information comes in handy for answering a lot of these questions. There is a, a kind of a cross-reference guide in Appendix L in the back. And when we did our little tour through the CPT manual, we did see that. It's, a, it's in um, Appendix L that has that information. When we're performing a lot of surgeries on the cardiovascular system. Um, there is quite a bit of uh, interventional radiology that's used. So you may start to see some of the radiology codes being introduced in this particular section. Of course, when we're talking about CPT, going back to that RBRBS, which is the resource-based relative value system, Everything has been taken into consideration historically to perform these particular procedures. So some are grouped, some are bundled, some are, I think we've all kind of seen that a little bit, but in our notes, of course, we want to pay attention to what is included in a particular procedure. Because these procedures are known to have that radiological assistance, a majority of them, it's bundled in, right? It's already bundled. But make sure if you're directed to add an additional code or directed to the notes or have to get a little bit more information from your operative note, 
use your use your tools. <coughs> so we have um, capital placement when it comes to a lot of these pr procedures as well. We could have non-selective or selective types of placement. There was a question that came up um, in the discussion board about uh, elective and non-elective. There are certain terms that do define these particular types of services. Sometimes there isn't a code available in the, the manual. Sometimes there isn't. So keep that in mind that, um, you know, because we're missing half of the story, it could be the other half where we're, you know, take that into consideration. Has anyone used any of the, um, like posted a question out there if you can't find something for too long? Have you posted a question out there to Google or anything? Do you do that? I just Googled the CPT code, Okay. And do you, do you ever, has anybody done this and ever come across any of the blogs AAPC yes. or yes. Supercoder yes. or you have. Yes. So those are tools. Yes. Those are tools because sometimes instead of taking the time to chase your own tail with these coding assignments, you know, utilize those because once you do become certified and you're utilizing your uh, your association, whichever you choose to be with, you'll be actually participating in those blogs yourself. You can post questions as well. Um, it's, everybody does it. So it is something that I highly recommend because sometimes it can provide a little bit more information on that rationale without you having to make that decision. Sometimes it, it, it isn't helpful at all. Yeah, but it's better to try it and not need it than, or at least you get a little bit further in the process instead of spending too much time and if you're spending way too much time, then walk away for a little while and then go back to it. Sometimes yes. I find too that in those blogs they have the old stuff. So mm -hmm. you're looking at like 2009 old codes, codes, right? And they don't exist anymore. So you go right. back and say, well, I don't understand why they put this one or it's changed yeah. or something like that. So you have to be careful. <coughs> yeah. You can um, one word of advice if you, if you do run into that is uh, there are crosswalks, what they call crosswalks. So you can do kind of like put in a search for, you know, CPT 2009 code, crosswalk to 2014 CPT code. So you can, you can use that key term crosswalk to get a little bit more direction as to where it is that you want to go. Um, they can be very, very beneficial. I know some coders out in industry will maintain their own crosswalk for their own records so that they have that data because as the years go by, you know, to be able to look back and say, oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, I remember the old code, so let's just figure out where it went. Yeah. Right. right. And, you know, instead of having to spend too much time going through the appendix, mm -hmm. that, that kind of does that for you because it, but it only has the previous year. So, of course, when you're coding an industry and you have your little library you can have every year that you <laughs> possibly been doing coding, you can have every year um, there for you. CPT Assistant is another tool for that, but the only thing with that is most healthcare organizations don't utilize that publication or that service because it's so costly. So, so when we're talking about the central venous procedures, there are a few different questions to ask because most coding is based on the four points that I have here. Um, the age of the patient. You're gonna see the age of the patient from zero to five years old, from five to 12, from if you, there are specific age groups within these codes. When we talk about the integument,